All right, welcome to today's lesson on classes, part one, where we learn how to create an actual class. This will be followed later on by part two, where we will learn how to use that class in our programs. So, object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is an architectural style based on modeling objects in the real world. What this means is that your entire program is going to consist of a variety of objects that are interacting with each other. So think of Call of Duty. In Call of Duty, you have a person object and another person object, and each person object probably holds some sort of gun object that fires bullets objects, and when those bullet objects hit a person object, it causes damage, and so on. So the whole world is going to be those objects interacting with each other. Now the objects in our program are going to follow three basic rules. The first rule is that each object must store information about themselves. We call these things attributes, and they're basically the characteristics of an object. The second rule is that each object can respond to queries or questions about their attributes. The third is that objects can modify their attributes in response to commands from other objects. We call these last two rules services. So these are services that the objects perform, answering questions about themselves and changing attributes about themselves based on commands. So let's take a look at an example of what this might look like. So I want to do a program where I can buy some Justin Bieber tickets. All right, and particularly here's my auditorium, and I'm, I'm a big Justin Bieber fan, so I want those front row seats. To make this program, I'm going to have a concert in my theater being my object. So I have a concert object. So what might some of my attributes be of that concert object? Well, I would have a band name, the date of that particular concert, a ticket price for a particular concert, which seats are sold, which seats are still unsold, etc., etc. These are all attributes or something about that concert that I know. Okay? Then I'm going to have a bunch of queries I could respond to about that concert. So for example, who is playing at the concert? In which case I'd tell them the band name attribute. Is ticket AA19 still for sale? What's the total value of all the tickets I've sold so far? So again, remember, all these things are questions where I'm going to have to get a piece of information back about that particular object. I can also respond to particular commands that are going to allow me to change my attributes. So for example, sell ticket AA19. So that's going to have to make me change a particular ticket from sold or from unsold to sold. Okay. Now, we're talking about all these objects. However, we don't actually work with objects in our programming world. We don't. We never code an object. Instead, what we program or create code for is called a class. And a class is basically a definition for a group of objects with the same attributes and services. So I might make a class for a concert, and then I can have a bunch of different concert objects. So I might have a Justin Bieber concert, a uh, U2 concert a Jay-Z concert, whatever concerts I might have. I can have a, a whole bunch of them. Each one of those concerts is all going to have the same attributes. They're all going to have a band name. They're all going to have a ticket price. They're all going to have sold and unsold seats. Okay? They're all going to have the same services where I can sell a ticket. I can buy a ticket. Right? All those kinds of things are all available to all objects of that particular class. Okay? Each of those individual objects is called an instance of that class. So I'm going to have multiple instances of the concert class. So how do we actually do this in our programming language? How do we code this in Java? Well, we have to do this in two steps. The first step is to either create the template, which we're going to learn how to do today, or import the code from somewhere else, which is what we've been doing so far. Every time at the beginning of our programs where we say import hsa.console or import java.util, we're importing those class templates that someone else has programmed. Once we've done that, we've either created it or imported it, then we can make an object of the class or an instance of that class and start using it. So whenever we did string buffer equals new string buffer, I've made an object of a string buffer and I can start using the methods, append, right? Um, or string tokenizer or any of those objects that we've made, a new console, right? And then I can do c.print, c.println, all those things, we've made an object and we're going to start using it. We'll look a little bit more in detail on that in our next lesson. Today we're focusing on number one, creating the template for that class. So we're going to make a class called Bank Account that can be used to instantiate or make instances of objects that keep track 
of the amount of money I have. In order to do that, we're going to have to have some attributes. Now, there may be a lot of attributes that we could have for a bank account. We're going to focus on only a couple. So we're going to have a string attribute, which is going to be the name of the account itself. So like uh, my vacation account, or my savings account, or my checking account. We're going to have an account holder, which is also a string. So who owns this bank account? And then we're going to have a balance, which has to be a double because it's an int, uh, um, a decimal number, right? Dollars and cents. We're going to have some services, both queries and commands, that we can do with our bank account. So we've listed them here. Okay. Um, you'll notice we've got one, two, three, four that are going to be commands because they do not return anything. They're just going to be used to change the name, change the bank account holder, deposit money and withdraw money from a bank account. We're also going to have one query where we're going to tell us what the current balance is of this particular bank account. So you notice that all of those were public. And again, this goes back to the lesson we did before on methods. But basically what it means is that a public method and any attributes you make are that are public can be accessed by other programs that imports this class. Okay, So we can run, in another program, we can run the get balance and deposit methods. Okay? If these were private, they could only be run by the class itself that we're making right now. Because of this, we want to make sure that all attributes are always going to be private. Okay? This is because we don't want someone else to come in and directly change the balance of a bank account and make it eight billion dollars. We don't want them to be able to do that. We want them to have to only be able to change it through a method that we provide. In other words, they have to deposit money into the bank account in order to be able to change the balance. I don't want them to ac access that, that value directly. They have to do it through the methods that I have created for them. So it's going to be private. They can only access it by using the public methods that I have created. So the static word that a lot of you have sort of been questioning over the last little while. Static variables and methods can be accessed directly without making an object. So I don't have to make, for example, a bank account object. Okay? We've used this before when we've done our math methods. So if I want to get a random number, I don't have to make a math object first. I can just go say math.random, bada boom, bada bing, here's a random number. Okay? I don't have to make an, a new math object first. If they don't have the keyword static, we can only use them if we have made an object of that class first. So for example, when I had a string, I had to make a string and then do that string dot length or a string buffer or C dot print line. I had to make a console before I could print to it. In this case, we'll take a look and all of our methods don't have the word static in here. That's because I want you to have to make a bank account before you can deposit to it. You have to have a bank account object before you can withdraw from it. So none of these are going to be static because I want you to have to make an object first before you can run any of those methods. So we now know we have to make a bank account in order to be able to run those methods on it. Well, how do we do that? How do we actually make a bank account? We do that using a specialized command called a constructor. A constructor is going to basically initialize all of those attributes of our object. We're going to do that by providing arguments to the constructor's parameters. We're going to have two different constructors that you could use to make a bank account, each with a different set of parameters. So the first one is going to give you a name and account holder only, and this will set up a bank account with a balance of zero dollars. The second one that we're going to create is going to be a bank account where you have to give the name, the holder, and an amount. And in this case, we'll make it a bank account with the balance amount of dollars in it. Now notice when you have these constructors, a couple of things. Number one, there is no return type because I'm not returning anything. I'm creating something new. And we'll also notice that the name of this method is exactly the same as the name of the class. So in order to make a bank account object, I have to have a bank account constructor. Okay. You'll also notice there that I had two methods that had the same name. And you can do this provided that the parameters that you give are different. And Java will recognize which one of these bank account constructors to use based on which parameters are given at the time we want to create them. Okay. This strategy is called method overloading. So having multiple methods 
that have a different set of parameters available to them. I cannot do this with two exact same uh, parameter values. Okay. So I've thrown a lot of theory at you here. Some of it's kind of probably floating around and going, I don't really get it. Let's take a look at an example program to see if we can clarify what some of this looks like. So here's the bank account class that I've created. Okay. So you know it's just the same as before. It's a public class bank account, just like we've made all of our programs previously. The next thing you'll notice is that I have put all of my attributes inside the class, but not inside any method. I've also made all those attributes private, as we said before, because I don't want anyone accessing them except through the public methods that I've given. Okay. Then I start making all of my methods inside my class. So I have my constructors. Here's one constructor. This constructor, public bank account, is going to require you to give me a name, an account holder, and an amount. And all I'm going to do, essentially, is set those values to the attributes I've given. So this bank account's account name is going to be equal to the name that you've provided in a, per, as an argument. The account holder will be set to the holder that you've provided as an argument. And similarly, the balance, my object's balance is going to be equal to whatever balance you told me you wanted it to be. Okay. Same thing with the second constructor, except in this case, you didn't give me a balance, so instead, I'm going to set the balance to zero, because you're not giving me a balance to start with. An example of a method I might create, in this case it's going to be a command. We had the change name, and you have to provide me with the name you want to change to. And again, it's very simple and straightforward. All I'm going to do is change the name of my account that was set in my constructor and that is stored as an attribute. I'm going to change that value to whatever name you've given me as an argument. And similarly, with my query, in this case, I have to return a double because it's going to be getting the balance. So I'm going to return the balance, whatever the balance is currently set at, here, that's going to return it. Now I've left out the other methods from this, the deposit and withdrawal, because when I see you in class, your next task is going to be to try and fill out the rest of this class here and create the missing methods. Okay? That's it. That's all I have for today. Hopefully we've learned a little something. We'll talk about how to use this class in a real program in our next lesson. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow when we can practice what we've learned.